Uh, okay, normally you, you should be able to see my screen. Um, okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm really happy to present to you. And so for me, the idea is to present uh, the topic of, uh, of my research I'm doing at INRIA in both teams. Uh, I'm belonging to SODA for social data team in INRIA Saclay and pre-medical team with a new INSERM and INRIA team at Montpellier. And so for a short presentation, uh, who am I? So I'm an engineer by training. I started uh, in chemistry and biology mostly. And um, maybe as many women, in fact, we uh, somehow start by uh, maybe more applied science. And then we shift, I shifted towards uh, statistics through biology, learning bioinformatics first, and then applying it in a biotech uh, called Pendulum Therapeutics in San Francisco. I was in the Staten Cupin team. And now I decided to uh, do research. And I'm in uh, now a third year PhD student at INRIA. And here are my, um, my uh, three PhD advisors. Uh, you can see Julie Joss on the left, who will maybe join us, Erwan Scorne and Gael Barocco. Um, I want to say that I'm super happy to receive questions. Um, and uh, following uh, Jihan and Victor's advice, feel free to interrupt the talk and ask many questions. I'm okay with that. I think it's easier. Uh, in particular, as I guess uh, you have very different backgrounds in uh, machine learning or in stats or in data science. So I'm really uh, welcoming any question you may have. Going back to my PhD advisor, you can see that you can read your causal inference, you can read your random forest, and you can read your psychic learn, so machine learning tools. And you may wonder, okay, but uh, the talk is about causal inference and what is the link with machine learning? And first of all, I will try to, uh, to explain this in particular as this is the woman in machine learning in Paris. And so uh, I cannot start directly to the research question, but how machine learning can be used in this question. Okay, um, first, if we explain what is machine learning, and you're probably all used to it, we know that machine learning works well with big data. It relies on non-parametric tools, and mostly it's seeking for predictions. If I start to introduce a little notation for now, basically, you've probably all used to the fact that we have a set of features, for example, um, the neighborhood, the, the, the surface of the apartment, uh, the number of windows and so on. And you may want to predict the price of the housing or the apartment uh, denoted Y for your, the label or the outcome of interest. And so in machine learning, all that matters is prediction and whatever the tools you used, and for example, random forest or neural net, you want to estimate this quantity and be the most precise for this prediction task. But when we go to other fields, and for example, econometrics or clinical research or other social science fields, for example, in fact, first of all, we usually have small data sets. Uh, for example, a clinical trial, it's 1,000 individuals and it is already a big trial. Usually, people rely a lot on linear or parametric model. I'm thinking in particular to an uh, econometrics book, and you can read many, many things about linear model. And most important, people in those fields are willing to answer causal questions. And I will try to introduce the notation later, but the idea is that the question is not the same and you are no longer interested in prediction. It sounds weird as we all think in a way that if we are able to predict something, it means that we have understood it, but in fact, it's a bit different. Why is it different? For example, if I am an hospital, and I know that someone has received some specific treatment, my machine learning algorithm will say, oh, the person is really likely to die because this treatment is given to people who are already in bad situations. But you cannot measure with this kind of algorithm if the treatment is actually working. And if I want to add another sentence to what I've said, in fact, when you are doing causality, you change the world in such a way 
that you are breaking the associational link between features and outcome. And in fact, you are no longer doing prediction. And because this is women uh, of machine learning group, I also want to give uh, one, one name, the name of Susan Haiti, who is really an inspirational figure for me. Uh, she is a researcher who, to me at least, was able to bridge the gap in between the two. She did machine learning and econometrics and really succeeded in doing the two. And you can find many talks of Suzanne online. And I really advise you to watch some of the talk. So basically, in my research, I'm trying to merge the two, use the non-parametric tool of machine learning to answer such questions for econometrics, public policy, or clinical research. Here is just an example of causal questions. Um, for example, uh, let's just to give you the idea of the question we're answering. We are, not, we are, for example, answering questions such as, is there an effect of financial incentives on teacher performance? And this is a question from Duflo, another woman. Anyway, if now we go to the canonical and empirical trick to measure a treatment effect, uh, you probably know it already. And the main idea is to say, okay, if I want to measure the effect of the treatment, I will take a sample of individual, split the sample in two, treated individual and placebo individual, and compare the two groups. This is what I am doing. And what is very important is that within my study sample, the split between the two groups is really at random. And then you compare how the two group evolves. And I want to insist on the fact that maybe you've heard this technique through, for example, A-B testing. I know A-B testing is really used in companies to compare app or in marketing to compare two approaches to sell product. This is exactly the same idea as doing a clinical trial. The two names, in fact, are for the same concept. How can we mathematically denote this problem? Uh, today, I will use what is called the Potential Outcomes Framework. This framework has been proposed now one century ago by Neyman, and Neyman was doing this kind of empirical trick of splitting a sample in two, but for crops. Uh, he was interested in fertilizer and crop, and you can see that, again, this technique appears. And the way Neyman proposed to put the problem is to say, okay, you all have two outcomes, that is two health status if you're treated or not, for example, two headache pain level if you give the aspirin or not. And this is the way we think at causality usually. Usually, you take the treatment and you, you say, oh, I am feeling better than if I had not taken the treatment. And so you are always constantly comparing your situation with the potential situation if you had taken or not the treatment. And by doing so, what we do is to denote why, for example, headache pain level with a one if you take the treatment and with a zero if you don't take the treatment. And the, the real important thing is that you cannot observe the two. You can only guess what would have happened in the other world. And somehow it's like quantum physics. You can only you know, open the box and see if the cat is dead or not, but you cannot see all situations. And the schematic on the right is to illustrate the fact that, in fact, as a statistician, we are looking at the problem as a missing value problem, just simply stating the fact that OK, uh, when I decide uh, in the randomized control trial or the A-B test to give the treatment or the policy to someone, I click on a button and I will never be able to see the other option. And I could have clicked on the other way around. Next slide is a little bit formal just to explain you, uh, in fact, what did Neyman as derivation one century ago and how is it useful today? Um, because now if we have the experiments of these two groups, we can do basically this estimator is um, uh, computing the mean over the treaty if A equal one, oh sorry, yes, if A equal one, it means that I give you the treatment. If it's equal to zero, I give you placebo. And so this estimator, we compare the two situation. If you give the treatment minus empirical average, if you do not give the treatment to the individual and you divide by the probability to receive or not the treatment. For example, here it's half-half. You really split your sample in two. You could have said, decided to split in another proportion. Why this procedure works, and this is just to introduce you the notation, because if I take the first term of this estimator here, 
In fact, what I am targeting is the expected value of y times a, the treatment allocation over pi. And because I randomized in my sample, I'm able to separate the two and just target the counterfactual outcome y1. That is, what is the expected value of my outcome, for example, headache pain level, if I give treatment to everyone in the group? And by doing this, I can uh, observe, like measure something because I'm measuring something on a population and no longer at the individual level. And Neyman worked also on statistical properties at the time. And for example, uh, such estimator is unbiased and you can have variants of this estimator. Uh, for those doing mostly machine learning, remember the risk is equal to the bias squared plus the variance. So we are in fact estimating the risk of such procedure. And it is important as variance and bias will allow us to compute confidence interval. And so when you're doing a clinical trial, it's very, very important to know if you can conclude or not on an efficacy. And if I put some math, now what I am targeting is the expected uh, treatment effect. So the expected value between treated and controlled. Just to go back uh, on machine learning, remember machine learning, you're targeting this quantity, trying to estimate the response, uh, taking a bunch of features. Here I presented you how we can encode causal question within the potential outcome frameworks. For example, this quantity now denotes the expected value of my outcome if everyone in the population gets treatment. Usually people are looking for the contrast of the two how, many, how uh, the treatment will lower your headache pain level based on the baseline, so if you do not give the treatment. And if you've heard about personalized medicine, in fact, in personalized medicine, we are targeting this quantity, that is the effect of the treatment on subgroups. So you can, all these also are working with this framework. And I just want to mention that maybe some of you have heard about Judy Apple, who has done a very famous book called The Book of Why. And the notation are a bit different. So I will not use the notation of Jude Apple today, but just for you to know, you can have a look. It's the same ID, but different notations. And of course, most of the time, data are not uh, as clinical trial or A-B test because you do not give the intervention at random. So most of the time, you have a bias in between people that, for example, um, uh, take some treatment or not. And so you cannot compare directly the two mean it's not uh, it's if if you compare the two mean between treated and controlled you're just looking at association and this is just because you have some random assignment that you can deduce causal question machine learning is used a lot a lot for observational data to disentangle the confounding but my purpose here today is mostly to just go back to the A-B testing and the clinical trials. Because, because even if those uh, empirical tricks to measure the efficacy are, uh, sounds really nice and apparently everything solves, we have bias, we have variance, we understand the stats, we have notation. In fact, we can find some drawback to this uh, method. I told you about Neyman one century ago. I just want to point out that, um, and now I will focus on the medical field, but for those doing A-B tests or so on, you can take everything that I say and replace randomized controlled trials by, by A-B tests and you will, it will be the same. But anyway, in the medical field, uh, you can find in fact RCTs, so randomized controlled trials, centuries with a S ago, and the method is not new. What is really new today is the fact that it has become the, the gold standard to two things. One, put a treatment on the market and decide whereas this treatment is more efficient than the previous one. And second, most of the time trials are used to assess the price and fix the price of a treatment. And here it's a screenshot of the FDA's website. And you can see that for each randomized controlled trial, you have the active ingredient associated and the, the, the disease uh, it is supposed to cure. And even if RCTs are really used a lot today, and when I say today, it's uh, the 50 years ago, it has been used a lot. 
in fact, they are now uh, in increasingly under scrutiny uh, for many reasons, in particular because sometimes sample size are super limited. I'm thinking about oncology or also because, uh, and it's the same for A-B test, you're looking at short time frames and maybe you don't see the impact on the long term of something. And also because samples are said to be unrepresentative. And I will explain what I mean by unrepresentative. All these limits uh, motivate, I guess, the current call and the media hype you can read now about real world analysis, real world evidence within the medical field. And today, now, in fact, my research question is only focused on the representativeness of the population in clinical trial. When I started this PhD research, I've noticed something and I'm now even more convinced that in fact, representativeness of the population in medical research is usually and most of the time thought as the lack of representativeness of something. Uh, two examples, you can read some paper that says, yes, this trial that allow um, such treatment for uh, uh, to prevent thrombose uh, could have recruited only 10% of the patients actually treated now uh, in the country. And you can also find other study comparing what is called tables one. So table one in a clinical field are tables that gives you, okay, the patients recruited in the study are uh, looking like this. For example, we have 20% women. We have uh, patients that are 50 years old. For example, maybe you remember during COVID, uh, the AstraZeneca trial had recruited uh, younger people than the Pfizer trial. So this is typically table one. And people usually compare the two table one and say, okay, uh, my actual population is different than the population in the trial. Maybe I cannot conclude. And my research work is trying to present a method that will actually correct for a lack of representativeness, combining several data sources and somehow proposing an answer like quantifying how much this sample is not representative and help to give an answer rather than giving a non-answer in a way. I told you, I will explain you what I understand, what I mean by representativeness. This is a real world example from the medical field where I have two data sets. I have the CRASH-3 trial on the left and a pink, uh, which is a big, big, large, large international trial that says, yes, tranexamic acids uh, cure uh, or can prevent at least some brain injured deaths. And in blue, I have data from a big, a big large national core French court called the trauma base uh, over many hospitals in France. And what I want to, to, to know, uh, I want to know if the what has been assessed on the CRASH-3 trial is still valid on my French population and in particular, for example, in APHP. And I compare the two populations. I take only one covariate for now, uh, one covariate or feature. My feature here is Glasgow score, so the severity of the trauma. And you can observe that in the trauma base, you have low trauma. So if a high Glasgow score is patient with low trauma and more patient with very, very high, very high head trauma. Whereas in the trial, I have more individual in between. And maybe this is a problem because if I imagine that my probability to die is here as a function of the Glasgow score, so the severity of the trauma. And I can imagine that if I do not treat my patient, this is the probability to die as a function of the Glasgow score, the blue curve. If I give the tranexamic acid to the patient, I, have, I imagine that I have an answer. And this answer, the way the patients react, is also a function of the Glasgow score. And this is the orange curve, the treated curve. You can see that. In pink here, this is where uh, crash three trial uh, recruited patients. And here, this is where I, my patients, when I look at the trauma base uh, court. And what we can observe is that as we assess the average treatment effect, you can see that here, the crash three trial is likely to overestimate the treatment effect on my target population, that is the trauma base. 
So I may be concerned and I re I remember we have uh, first clinical trial uh, are used to allow a treatment to be put on the market and second to put the price. So it's very important uh, we can estimate as best as possible this average treatment effect. Indeed, everything that we measure on the trial, in fact, depends on the population on which we measure the, the, the quantity. And this is why I highlight here the expectancy. This is the same as in machine learning when you want to generalize a learner to another population. Now, uh, so in this research work, we enhanced the, the notation of the potential outcome framework, basically keeping everything that I've presented to you before, A for treatment, X for covariate, Y for observed outcome. But now we are thinking at a uh, population level and try to understand, okay, I have a trial with sampling individual from a population PR, and I have an observational data set sampling M individual. This is my trauma bus, for example, from a population PT with another distribution. On the right, you can see a schematic where here you have your randomized control trial with treatment information and outcome information with some distribution. And on the right, imagine that now I have a sample of the actual population I want to treat as a policymaker. And you can see here with the math, the problem I've uh, explained to you with the graph before, that is, in fact, the average treatment effect in my trial RCT will be estimated on a population PR, whereas I'm interested at the average effect on another population. So what we've proposed to do with Julie, Gail, and Erwan is to enrich the trial data with the information we have from the trauma base. In other words, what would have been measured if the crash three trial were some individual, sorry, were sampled from the trauma base. And the idea is to take the previous estimator I showed you for a simple trial or A-B test, and now put some weight on the estimation. That is, each individual will have a weight and the weight will reflect how much this individual looks like the trial or the, the trauma base data set. In other words, ah, there is a question, maybe, or, or this is just a mic. It seems to be the mic. Really, don't hesitate to interrupt me. So I just want here to show you that, uh, so the name is IPSW, but maybe you don't want, you, you don't care about this, this, this idea. You just want to understand that I put some weights, and for example, I will put a high weight for an individual in the crash tree with a high Glasgow score uh, because it looks like trauma based individual. And the question we had with Julie Geller one was okay, but what is what are the properties of such procedure? You can see that such procedure depends on two data sets, N and M. N is the trial sample size, and M is the a large cohort sample size, the observational sample size, for example, the trauma base. And so the question is, okay, how can you compute confidence intervals with such estimator? In stat, you know, usually you compute confidence interval or tests. It depends on one data set size. And here we have two. What can we do? And also how to compute those weights? Of course, you can use machine learning to, to compute these weights and find the perfect weights balancing the two populations. Ideally, if you use machine learning to estimate these weights, you need to target a density ratio. And maybe some of you know many methods to estimate density ratio. Um, and before doing any estimation, uh, and for those who have done causality before, you know that you need to have causal assumption to know that what you're doing is more or less correct. And here, and I will just go fast on this because I guess it's a bit complicated, except for those maybe used to causal inference. These are are the two causal assumptions we need to generalize the, the treatment from trial to target population. Maybe do not read the formula if you it's a bit complex because you're not used to the notation. And just understand that, okay, Glasgow score, I need it because it's shifted between the two data sets and it is modulating the treatment effect. I will need all covariates such as the Glasgow score. And I hope that for all covariates, each individual individuals in the target population was represented in the trial. And you see that for the Glasgow score, it's 
true. For example, if the crash tree had sample individual of Glasgow score of eight or below, I would have had a problem because I had no, no individuals on the rest of the support. I just want here to focus maybe, and so we have time for a question on these two questions, because when we're doing research, um, at first you do many, many review, and then you apply the method. And when we apply the method with Julie, we were like, okay, uh, what is the impact of our two data sources sizes on my precision? And also which covariate should I use? Because of course you have causal assumption and we have noticed that uh, in applied work, people were willing to put many, many covariates to adjust on every shift between the two populations. And we were wondering whether or not this procedure is correct and if it leads to better estimates. And so we tried to answer these two questions uh, we used some assumption and we could have used some uh, modeling assumption, uh, parametric assumption. We decided to use the fact that uh, all the covariates we will adjust on are composed of categorical covariates. In the medical field, is uh, most of the, it depends on the application, but in the application we faced for now, it's more or less the case as we have gender, smoking status, Glasgow score, insurance status, and so on. So these are quickly our contributions, more in the form of answers, and I will not detail all the derivation. Um, first of all, how do we estimate the weights? Because we are looking at uh, bins, so categorical covariates, uh, we can just count how many times some combination appears in some uh, uh, at some level, for example, you will count in the trial how many you had women with certain insurance status with some Glasgow score and estimate the probability, the, the density of the population of the trial like this and do the same for this term here, uh, which is the weights in the target population. Here you can recognize the weights and here you can recognize the usual RCT estimator procedure. Um, we did some simulation at first to look at uh, the effect of some parameter. And here, the simulation I'm looking at, I'm taking a toy simulation first and think about, okay, assume that my treatment effect is modulating along a covariate X with two levels, for example, a genetic mutation. You can see that for all individual treatment effect is around nine. And then if I look at the treatment effect, for uh, no mutation, it will be around six, and it will be six, and it will be around ten for uh, mutated uh, patients. And the question is, okay, this trial was launched on a population with a lot of people with x equal one, and you can see that here my estimated effect is closer to this than this. But imagine that in my target sample, I have less individual with the mutation. First, we observe that the procedure of re-rating allowed us to correct for the bias. So here, this is the <coughs> average effect uh, on the trial. And here, this is the effect on my target population. So it is correcting everything. But what we observed <coughs> is that uh, depending on the trial sample size, you can see that the variance is different. Um, maybe there is a question. I, I admit people that... Uh, and what we, what we observe is that, uh, so remember, M is my uh, trauma bus size in a way, and N is my crash tree size. And what we observed is that if your observational sample size is small, you can still increase the size of the RCT. You will never gain in precision. At some point, we'll saturate the precision, and your estimation procedure will be uh, somehow blocked. But then if you increase the sample size M, so the target sample size, you will be able to lower and to be more precise. And instead, this is what we want. We want to be consistent, that is targeting the right quantity at the end. And so we characterized uh, such phenomenon um, and in particular show that the variance, and so it implies the way you will compute your confidence interval depends on the two data set sample size. We've characterized several regimens, and maybe I, I would say that most of the time here, lambda will be equal to 10. Assume that an observational sample size is upside 10,000, a trial is 1,000, and so lambda is equal to 10. 
And then the variance of your estimation procedure will depend on the two. And the terms here depend on the term lambda. Um, so this was a result that explained all the simulation we had and what we observe in the real world practice. And another thing was worrying us. It was the fact that we didn't know if we needed to put many covariates in the estimation procedure or not. Remember, the covariates we need or the features we need to generalize the treatment are treatment effect modulator, so the covariates modulating treatment effect that are shifted between the two population. And in practice, we've seen that uh, physicians and clinicians were tempted to add as many covariates as possible so that you do not uh, miss important ones like Glasgow score. But doing so, we may wonder if, for example, if gender is added, but there's no modulation of treatment effect if you're a woman or a man and it's the same effect. Uh, and so is it a problem then to add gender? And we've answered by, so this is the formula, but on the right, I put the simulation. Uh, we answered by, yes, this is a real problem if you do this. Uh, you will, in fact, uh, multiply your variance uh, by a term and will be less precise in your estimation. So here, the plain line is just the transcription of this formula, where you see that the variance with the minimal set of covariate x is multiplied by a term to be equal to the variance on the complete set x plus x plus v. And the multiplier term is depends on the density ratio. So the more shifted between the two data sets, for example, if you have only 10% men uh, in the target population and the trial was done on a population with 90% male, then you may like multiply your treatment effect by two or three, uh, your um, variance by two or three, and therefore your confidence intervals. So do not include non-necessary covariates in your precision. And we have another funny result that is, okay, but now what happens if I have a covariate known to modulating the, to modulate the treatment effect, but this covariate is not shifted between the two data sets. So now, for example, the trial had 50-50 men and, and women, and we know that there is a modulation of effect uh, for men and for women, uh, but we don't want to add this covariate because it's not shifted. In fact, you should add this covariate. I don't put the formula here, but adding this co the covariate will now reduce the variance and you will be able to be more precise on your estimation. Now we should have like uh, 15 minutes to discuss uh, and take many, as many questions as you want. Uh, my final words will be about the fact that uh, RCTs or clinical trials are cornerstones of modern based medicine. I think they will remain, uh, even if it's not in fact an evidence when we look at history of medicine and they have limits. And now we are thinking as a community, as a statistician, physician and clinician, thinking about, about how we can correct those bias. And this is all what we call real world data. What I presented today to me is a way to uh, somehow warn about the fact that a treatment effect measured on a clinical trial could be uh, overestimated or underestimated compared to what we will have in the real world. But if you want to build those methods, uh, I really want to insist on the fact that we need to understand the assumptions. Uh, because when people say, now we want to merge several data sources, you see that you have some new assumptions and maybe you want to understand the theory behind what do you expect on your procedure uh, to believe or not the results. And I think it's even more important in medicine where the goal is to cure patients. And here the idea was to show um, that maybe don't put all the covariates because you may ruin your analysis. And you know, most of the time I have the feeling that uh, we are listening to the news and hearing the fact that, oh, machine learning will replace a uh, physician. I'm sure it will change drastically the way uh, we do medicine, but I think we are not excluding physicians or epidemiologists at all. I think um, data with only people doing stats 
uh, may ruin the result and we i really uh, on my daily like research work are talking a lot with epidemiologists and physicians and clinicians to understand the data and understand the problem and understand the questions and i cannot conclude on any medical questions without uh, intense exchange with them so i think uh, this is not as bad as we can hear in the news about everything that's happening today in stats and now uh, thank you so much for your attention and don't hesitate to ask many questions and i hope you learned something today